What is up, my friend? Welcome to episode 92 of the ANSI Trading Mix podcast. Today, I'm bringing on a money management expert named Nick True to talk about why you should pay yourself first and also why you should set aside your profit first. Setting aside profit first is something I've recently decided to do inside my business, and it's become a game changer for me. And I find a lot of entrepreneurs, they are really good at marketing and sales and strategy. And believe it or not, though, they're pretty bad with managing money. And I recently read a quote that I think was from Shims Hartwell. You may remember him from episode number 22. He posted something on Instagram a few weeks back that said, the best hunters are the best trackers. And this got me to thinking, like, man, if I'm going to be like one of the best hunters inside this game of business, then I need to level up my tracking ability. I was like, I better, better level up my ability to track money. And since I've been doing that, it has been serving me big time. And so I thought I'd just bring you the guy I hired to share some wisdom with you. So if you're at a place where you want to create a new level of financial freedom for yourself and your business, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Anthony John Amix Podcast, the one and only podcast designed to help you become unstoppable in life and business. My name is Anthony John Amix. My friends call me AJ. And my goal with this podcast is to help you remember who you truly are so you can maintain your center in the chaos, embody your potential, and unlock freedom in your life and business. That being said, let's get into today's show. All right, welcome back. Today's guest is an amazing dude. He fell in love with personal finance at the age of 10, which sounds absolutely crazy. He discovered he was an entrepreneur when he started hustling candy at school, and little does he know that I too was known for hustling candy during lunch, and I uh, got shut down by the principal as well. In college, Nick, he had become the go-to guy for personal finance in his friend circle because he read every finance book he could get his hands on. And then after graduating college and starting his career as a mechanical engineer, he stumbled across the online business world and quickly realized he could have a career combining his passion of personal finance and teaching. And now Nick and his wife own and run an online brand called MappedOutMoney.com. They have a passion for creating approachable, actionable resources to help people become more financially settled. And on MappedOutMoney.com, they share how they're using money as a tool to live their own adventure and hope to inspire you to do the same. Now, before I bring on today's guest, I want to let you know about my book called Mindset is Not Enough. It's a book designed to help entrepreneurs escape the internal pressure that keeps them feeling frustrated, unfulfilled, and burnt out. It reveals the four ancient steps to having unshakable clarity, confidence, and certainty. This way, you can lead your industry, your market team, and clients with driven inspiration, unwavering conviction, and power. And you can get the entire book for free by just going to ajamix.com. Again, ajamix.com slash book. Uh, ajamix.com slash book. You can get your copy. So with that being said, let's bring Nick onto the show. Nick True, welcome to the podcast, brother. Dude, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here. Where are you coming from? Like you travel all the time. I can't keep up with where you're at. So where are you at today? Uh, today, I'm currently outside of Mobile, Alabama. Mobile, uh, so, Alabama. I've been there. Uh, have you really? I have been, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, we're, actually, we're actually looking to um, buy a house here in this yeah. area. And uh, it actually settled down. So after we've been on the road for three years uh, in our RV, and uh, we kind of been playing a waiting game here, trying to figure out uh, what our next steps are. But yeah, awesome. So we love this area. What's bringing you uh, to settling down? That's a big deal after traveling for three years. It is. It is, and it's um, you know, it's something that we have been talking about kind of thinking like originally maybe maybe 2021 okay you know like let's get we got a couple more big places in mind we wanted to make sure we hit you know uh and then COVID happened and and so this whole year just like was crazy with like all the cancellations and our whole route and our whole plans got canceled and so that sort of sort of got us thinking like okay well maybe we're ready to to sort of speed up the timeline if, if I could boil it down to one thing while we love traveling and we love being on the road, um, I think the one word that we kept coming back to was stability. Um, that has been drawing us down to like, let's maybe settle down and like find a house and we'll still keep the RV and go for a few months at a time. But um, just having some sort of stable home base to come back to has been really something we've been trying to look for, I think. And I think that's the biggest draw. 
Nice. Yeah, my wife and I, we had just pulled the trigger and bought a house a couple of weeks ago. It is now gutted and it's being remodeled no from really? the inside. Yeah. And so ours was the same thing. I had this yearning within me where I just wanted roots. I was so yes. sick and tired of living out of my bag and setting up my laptop here and there. And I, I mean, it's, it's enjoyable. Um, it just for me, I was like, man, I really miss just a space that totally. we can have that's ours. And then we'll still travel. We'll still hop on a plane and go places yes. and things of that nature. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, exactly what it is. Um, the weirdest thing about this process for us uh, has been we, so we got under contract on a house uh, and we were about to close. It was three days before closing. Uh, and then Hurricane Sally came through and put a pine tree through the living room of the house wow. that we were about to buy. Wow. So, so, so that was like two and a half weeks ago. And so now we're just like, okay, uh, I don't know what we're going to do next. And so we're, we're now basically just, we still want the house. We still love the area. We still like love everything. It's just a matter of like, it's got to get fixed. Sure, of course, of course. So now we're just kind of waiting and uh, and seeing what the homeowner and their insurance is going to do and how they're going to fix it and everything else. But so yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I was telling a friend about it, and he said that's like the worst good bad luck I've ever heard of because <laughs> it does not my problem. I don't own it right now with a with a pine tree through it. Um, but you know, I, I I was about to be in, and and then and then that happened. So it's awesome. It's Since you've traveled all over America, what what it led you guys to settle down in Mobile? So we, uh, like you said, we tried a lot and it's this balance of, um, a certain proximity to family, uh, and then also like a couple of things we really want. And so what we really want, we're actually not going to be settling in mobile. It'll be a small little town right outside mobile that's on the bay. Um, but it's a very like walkable town, super small. And like, we, we really wanted walkable. We really wanted like fun, little small community, we wanted somewhere close to the beach. This is like 40-ish, 45 minutes from the beach. Uh, and then this particular town is like uh, very artsy and like somewhat entrepreneurial and like lots of writers have come down and, and written books there. And they, and so it's it's got a vibe that we just really like. And it's all within about a six to seven hour drive from our family. And Perfect. so it feels like we didn't want to go all the way to the West Coast because all of our family's in Tennessee or something like that, for example. Awesome, man. Well, dude, let's talk about some money. Uh, I want to, I mean, I've, I've spent money to learn about money from you and it's been a game changer for the first time in my life. There's money in the profit count. There's money in the tax account. Um, been following the system that you taught me. How did you get into the game of, of mastering money and, and managing it? Yeah, I, um, so I've always, I, I grew up, uh, in a very like kind of business entrepreneurial household. Um, my dad was a business owner and, um, I grew up sort of being taught not a ton about personal finance per se, but a lot about, you know, if you want money to do things, you got to work hard and you can create, you know, create value for people and you can do these sorts of things. And then, and then you can make money that way. And I had all kinds of little businesses growing up that sort of got me interested in that. And, and that's sort of, I think typical for a lot of people who are in business. Um, the reason I got drawn to money in particular was um, I think just around the fact that money started buying me like freedom more than anything else. And so somewhere in like high school, college, I started reading a lot of personal finance books and just got really into this idea of um, if I could invest my money well and grow the money that I do get, um, that's going to be able to buy me freedom from doing things that I don't want to do. Fast forward through college, I kind of did everything that um, you were supposed to do. I went to college, got the grades, got the degree, got a job as a, a mechanical engineer and uh, in the most like Dilbert-esque office space movie, like that, <laughs> that the most office space environment you can possibly imagine. Uh, and it took me all of like a month to realize I did not want to build a career uh, doing that. And all along the way, I had been interested in finance and I'd been learning all this finance stuff. And at the same time, a couple of the jobs that helped me put myself through college were teaching piano lessons and then uh, tutoring math and doing ACT prep. And so I was, I was really into teaching and I was really into helping people in that way. Uh, and so I sort of saw this, Hey, all these, 
you know, sort of bloggers and YouTubers and podcasters that I've seen online that I followed around finance, they all, I didn't realize this, but they all like do this for a living. They make money doing this. Right. And then, and then I sort of married that with my own love of, of finance and teaching. And, and um, so I launched a, a website back in 2015 um, under a different name. It was called True Tightwad back then. And I've, I've changed since changed that brand for other reasons. Um, um, but I, I launched a blog back then and started just talking about um, more stereotypical personal finance things. And then all along the way, I got even more interested in the business side of finances and managing your money and being able to to make sure that you're running a business in a way that's profitable so that you can see the money in the profit account and then, you know, do the things that you guys want to do. That's really what it comes down to. So how did you, you know, when launching your, your personal brand, uh, what kept you out of your head since you saw all these other people talking about the same things that you want to talk about? What kept you out of your head and not talking yourself out of doing it? Because I think so many people who have a talent, uh, a skill set, a voice to share with the world, they get caught and like, well, they're already doing it. There's nothing yeah. I can do differently. How did you combat that? I, um, I think maybe there's, there's two things that help support me in that. The first, um, is I got really lucky in some ways in that I had a, a small friend group that I sort of became the go-to guy, uh, for personal finance. Right. And so as I was graduating college, I had just been into all of this and, for the first time in, in our lives, really, some of the friends that I was hanging around with in my engineering classes and as we were all getting jobs, um, none of us knew anything, right? So like all of a sudden we were getting jobs and there was like this 401k situation that we could sign up for. And then like friends had student loans that we had to deal with. And then, you know, hey, I got this credit card offer in the mail. And so everybody, a lot of the guys I ran around with knew that I was sort of into finance. And so they would just ask me questions about what I was doing or, or whatever. And that helped give me some confidence in my own personal life of like, Hey, there, there's some like friends of mine who need help with this stuff. And I seem to be able to help them somewhat just based on what I've been doing for myself. And so maybe I could do that for, you know, a larger, at a larger scale on the internet. So that, that was extremely encouraging to me because it, it wasn't, it, 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 there's definitely a lot of imposter syndrome. Like who, who am I to be this, you know, 20, whatever kid, um, you know, trying to do this. So I think, I think that was the first thing. The other thing was, uh, honestly, listening to podcasts like this. Um, and I got really into um, smart passive income at the time and back in 2015 and, and hearing these stories of people um, who it was the recognition that they didn't need to be the world's foremost expert on XYZ topic. They just needed to be a little bit more ahead than the people that they were coaching or teaching to. And I know that like you've probably heard that before and others have heard that before, but that like really resonated with me. And I took that and I ran with it and was like, that's, that's all I need. Like I just need to be a little bit ahead of the folks I'm working with. And as long as I can do that uh, and I can help teach them along the way, then, then I can maybe make a go of this. So good. Yeah. One of my favorite sayings in this industry specifically is our current prison is always someone else's paradise. Because totally. In the- because in the game of entrepreneurship, we always feel like we're in hell. Like we're like, I've never arrived. And we have, we, but the moment we arrive, we're already looking at another place to arrive to. <laughs> That's <laughs> so really long good. As, I don't think I've heard that before. So as long That's as we good. can package where we're at our current hell, essentially for us, and understand that it's, it's somebody else's paradise, then as we continue to level up and grow, we're just constantly packaging where we're at and lending that helping hand backwards, helping people collapse time. That's what's happening. Yeah, that's solid. And it, it keeps you really grateful, I think, for all of the places that you make. Because that's, I mean, I, I can do that to myself. I mean, like I have the life that I live right now is, is the paradise that I dreamed of three years ago. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking like, oh, I got to do this and I got to level up to that. And oh, and if I go, you know, it's, it's so easy to get caught in that trap. That's yeah. Now, one. did you guys have a house before you bought the trailer and left for three years? No, we uh, we lived in an apartment, and okay. so we had an apartment in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, so it wasn't as big of an uprooting as uh, as some people who maybe have a big house with a bunch of stuff in it, for sure. And that's what we did. We sold two properties, sold everything, and then left to Europe, and then came back uh, right before COVID, thankfully. And yeah. we're like, "Fuck! Now I got to buy everything else again." <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a big undertaking. That's a big undertaking. It's a crazy game. Yeah, it's a crazy game. So let's talk about a little bit more about money. Um, Do entrepreneurs, I feel like so many of them live with a lot of guilt around money. Uh, And we'll get into like their stories and limiting beliefs and all of that. But I think a lot of them think a lot of other entrepreneurs have it figured out. And is that the case? Or are you seeing a lot of times they're just like, nobody really has it figured out. Like they have the idea of marketing and sales figured out, but not money. I am. Um, yes. And, 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 and you're, you're spot on with that. And before I answer the question directly, like, can, can I tell a story that, of course. that really exemplified this for me? So um, I, um, I got involved and I think I, I think I can say his name. Um, but I got, uh, I got involved and was able to start doing marketing work for a guy named Grant Baldwin who runs a company called the speaker lab. Uh, and he basically has a business where he teaches people how to, um, get booked and paid as a speaker, as a professional speaker online. Uh, and, uh, he's phenomenal. He's somebody I followed for years. And when I got the opportunity to work for him, uh, for a couple of years, I jumped at it. I will never forget the first time, that um that i went in person to we had a team retreat and we were doing business planning for our upcoming quarter um and he invited me to come down and work with the team for a couple of days and um you have to understand like i i had followed this guy's podcast for years i'd look up to this guy like i thought he this guy is the man right um and i was so pumped and so I came down and we were there working together and like we all threw out ideas and he, he took my ideas just as seriously as he took anybody else's and we made a game plan and, uh, and you, you know, we set our projects for the next quarter. And then um, as we were walking out, leaving the offices to go back to the parking lot and I was going to head to the, to, to the airport to leave, um, he looked at me and, and he, he was like, he's like, so what do you think? You know, it was the first time doing something like this. I was like, man, it's awesome. He's really great. And he said, he's like, did you, uh, did you realize that, uh, nobody really knows what the hell anybody's doing? We're just kind of like making it up as we go. I was like, yes, I, I, I did kind of catch that. He was like, yeah, that's, that's the game. We're just making it up as we go. And that, that was like so encouraging to me too, because it may, it really pulled down his, you know, my guard and, and pulled down sort of the facade that like, yeah, you know, we have these grand plans and we have maybe these ideas, but like even the people that we really do look up to, um, we're just kind of all figuring it out as we go. And now, now he's, he's done very well with his like financials and money and all that stuff. So I'm not even, I'm not saying that he's, he's not got that stuff figured out, but, but the point is more about like, everyone is sort of just making it up as we go. Um, and so it, it puts everybody on a more level playing field, which is nice. And, and it makes me feel like we're all real people. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see entrepreneurs making when it comes to managing their money? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think the part of the, part of the problem is um, focusing on the wrong numbers. And a lot of this has to do with the vanity metrics, right? And so it's super fun to be able to say, oh, I did a uh, million dollars in sales this year, or I did um, however much this month, or we had a launch that did this much, uh, or we now have this many team members. When actually, depending on how much you're spending and your ad cost and everything else, you may not actually be making any money. And so at the end of the day, what truly matters is, are you profitable? And is that profit helping you live the life that you want? Not some life that you see on Instagram or on whatever, but like the life that you want. So I think the two biggest mistakes that I'm constantly having to work with people on is to stop focusing on revenue in and of itself. Like, yes, we have to grow revenue that matters, but we got to focus on all the other stuff that comes after that to make sure that we're actually profitable. And then two, even before that piece, what do you actually want your life to be? What's the vision you're trying to create here? What do you want? And then how much do you need to pay yourself to make that happen? Because when you really think about it, the, the majority of the time, a lot of what we say we want is just posturing for Instagram, right? It's not actually the life that we want. And if we were to get really clear on the life that we want, and we just focused on making that happen, it's, it's much more likely to happen than if we're, we're trying to get some fake life so that we can post on Instagram about it. Totally. And I, I believe we teach this within Project Shift is this thing called the success equation. And essentially, it's like X plus Y plus Z equals I'm successful or I'm worthy yep. or whatever. And so many people are like, when I have $50 million, then I, or when I have 100 employees, then I, and they get the 100 employees or the money or whatever. And then 
since they're operating with a par within a paradigm of success equation, that equation just keeps pushing down the endless horizon that never ends. And then they never arrive to their experience of fulfillment. And yes. it's, it's very detrimental. So how have you helped people kind of get out of that paradigm and get back into what I would say home, like here yeah. centered, grounded to figure out, well, I want to make X amount of money to be able to experience this and then using some of the services you offer to craft that. Yeah. So um, part, of, part of the way we do that is you had mentioned earlier, like people have a lot of guilt around money or, or can have guilt around money. And we, and it's recognizing that money a lot of the time is so, so emotional and there's so much emotion around it, either how we were raised or our experiences with it. And one of the ways that I try to work with people out of the gate is, is I tried to make money this sort of this amoral thing that is just a tool. It's just, it's just a tool like anything else. Like this microphone is a tool to make this podcast happen. Like Zoom is a tool for us to do software video chats. Money is a tool and money is a tool that you can use to make your life a certain way. And, and, and so it starts with like not making money the scoreboard. <laughs> like you said, like <clears throat> 50 million whatever or 10 million this or, or however many that. that. That's not the scoreboard. The scoreboard is actually nothing to do with money. The scoreboard is some painted picture of, of your life and what that looks like on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And then we say, okay, how much money does it cost to make that life happen? And that number might be really big or it might be really small or it might be somewhere in the middle. And so that gives us a target to start to aim, aim for. The way that I sort of work through this is um, – we we've created sort of a this this dream this d r e a m like sort of framework for helping you work through like where you're at now to where you want to go and using money as that tool in the middle um and a lot of that has to do with a mixture of super technical like okay how are we tracking your dollars and where are they going and what categories are you spending in and then and then also that really high level of like okay what's the vision you have for your life and and what do we need to make that happen I don't know if that answers your oh, question. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And are you a big proponent of like Dave Ramsey's every dollar philosophy? Uh, I know you're like big in YNAB where it's like give every dollar a job. And that was a big wake up call for me when, and it wasn't YNAB. I, it was actually, I think Dave that helped me understand yeah. that where my, my wife and I in our personal household, we spend every dollar, every yeah. single dollar that we make, it's, it is spent. And now it's spent very intelligently. At least we like to believe it is. And it's being chosen how to direct the flow. And when I started directing the flow, even when it was small, it started increasing and gaining momentum. And that was a huge shift for me was just like, whatever the flow is, just consciously direct the flow. And if yes. you'll be adamant on that, it does start building and building and building. Is that your philosophy as well? 100%. Yeah. Because see, like if you look up and, and, and look at um, sort of the research around um, habits and, and habit forming and decision making, what you'll find is that most psychologists agree that somewhere between 40 and 60% of every single decision you make is based on habits or being done subconsciously. So this is really small things like the route that you drive to work or to your favorite restaurant, you do it subconsciously. Uh, it could even be the, the pants you put on in the morning and which pant leg you put on first, right? All that happens subconsciously, even though it's a decision to really big things like the types of vacations you choose to take, the neighborhoods or the cities that you're going to buy in, um, the types of gadgets you're going to buy, the way you're going to build your business, all these decisions, 40 to 60% of them are based on subconscious habits, the people around us, we're not consciously making them. And so, yes, like your whole point of um, what I want you to do is I want you to get all of your dollars and then I want you to consciously make a decision with as many of those dollars as possible so that we can maximize the way you're using them for what you want. I would sort of um, tell people at the end of your life, you're going to have made a finite amount of money. Uh, even if you're Jeff Bezos, it's would be a really big number, but you could put that number on a screen and it would be finite. And if you think back to how you use those dollars, did you use them as, as much as humanly possible 
to do the things that you and your family found the most valuable and, and, and found brought the most value to you and the people around you and the way you wanted to impact the world? Did you use those dollars in that way? Or did you let them slip through your fingers because of subconscious decision making? And so that's, that's where budgeting and planning with every single dollar comes in. It's not to beat you over the head with a budget and says, you can't have fun. It's no, we want to have the most fun possible. And so we want to consciously decide what we're going to do with them. So good. There's a, a concept I've been wrestling with recently. And as I started thinking about legacy, because that's kind of the buzzword within the entrepreneurial market space right now. And I, I'm not a big fan of the word legacy, because I think it's coming from an egoic perception that's really not real. And so it's interesting to me when people are like, oh, I'm going on this journey to make money for my legacy. And then I started thinking about it. Most people aren't remembered after three generations. Mm -hmm. Like they're not. They go back to dirt and their life never existed. Yeah. The only people that I can see that are remembered and they have a legitimate legacy that lives on beyond them are people who are involved in the arts or some type of philosophy spiritual philosophy that helps people remember that they're sovereign creators and that they can continue to create. It's like, that's the thing that continues to perpetuate legacy. And so it's fascinating to me that the entrepreneurial marketplace is so caught up in this trap of thinking about money rather than what you're preaching and advocating, which I appreciate, which is like, what is it you want to experience? Because at the end of the day, the way that we make our family feel, our friends feel, and the moments and the memories, that's us instilling the values into those around us, which then actually do perpetuate a legitimate legacy. Would you agree? I totally agree. Yeah, it, it's not, um, I, I've never thought about it in those terms, but I can totally see that. And, and I can see how spot on you are because um even the, the business builders or business icons that let's say I would read about to maybe learn from, normally I'm reading about or learning from the ones who have had some other impact outside of the fact that, oh, they made a bunch of money. You know, like um, I heard a thing from Gary Vee a long time ago that I really stuck with me of um, how you make your money is just as important as making the money. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. like the relationships that you build along the way or the relationships that you damage along the way, um, like all that matters. You, you, you've got to be able to sleep good at night and you've got to be able to feel good about the way you left people. Um, and that's way more important than the money. And, and, and as you said, like it's the way we make uh, the people around us feel and the way that we're able to impact those people and the art that we can create and, and the contributions we have. And money is, is just a tool to help us be yeah. able to do some of those things. That's it. 100%. 100%. 100%. What is your advice to entrepreneurs about debt? Because uh, there's lots of different perspectives. You have some people in the personal finance category, which I haven't studied, but I was in a conversation with somebody who had studied it, which was like, um, I forgot the, the name, but it was something about the million dollar debt. Like there was a way where you accumulate debt in a healthy way to create security. That was like on the extreme debt side. Mm -hmm. And then you have Dave Ramsey on the other side who was like, no debt, suck it up, seven years. Yeah. Like, you know, and so there's like these two spectrums uh, that yeah. frame it. Where do you land on advising people on that? Um, maybe not surprisingly, um, my sort of shtick with most of personal finance is that we need to keep the word personal for front and, and front and center, um, which is that like personal finance is called personal finance for a reason. It's personal, which means that um, it's really easy. And, and one of the, from a business perspective, like Dave Ramsey is on point because like it's so memorable. He's got his stuff down. He's got a shtick together. And like, he just sort of espouses the same advice to everyone. And, generally speaking, if you follow that advice, um, you will not end up in a bad place, which is why that advice is like rock solid. Um, on the flip side, the other extreme, the guys who's like, oh, you can take on debt and build it. That guy, he's got to be careful <laughs> with, with, his, with his sort of advice because if everybody follows that, there will be some people along the way who are going to get really hurt. Um, I, I tried to take some sort of middle ground approach that says, it depends a great deal on a couple of things. One is your own risk tolerance. Some people 
cannot sleep at night with lots of debt on their backs. And it, it so crushes their emotional and like mental state that then they're worthless during the workday. And so that person needs to get out of debt so that they can actually be like a productive person towards their business. Right. And so I've seen, I've seen that happen in certain spaces where like they've taken on so much debt for their business, but they can't handle the mental and emotional like weight of that. And so then they're not going to be efficient or good at their business, which is going to be even more problematic. Right. And so you've got to handle your own risk. Talk. You've got to have some self-awareness around that. I, I would be, I would probably fall more into that category or I would at least lean more that direction me personally but I recognize that I have plenty of friends who don't lean that direction awesome the second thing is recognizing your business type and recognizing like do you actually need debt to fuel this business right there are some businesses where like taking on debt like for example investing in real estate and building up a real estate portfolio you got to do it smart and wise but it's nearly impossible to invest in real estate and build any sizable portfolio without the use of debt and leverage and so if you're in a business like that, there are some times where that's the name of the game, right? And, and so e-commerce would fall a little bit more in that world than let's say info product marketing, right? And so I personally, my business, I don't need debt to run my business. And so I'm not going to take it on needlessly. Whereas other people in their business with their structure, they may. And so I would say knowing yourself, your own risk tolerance, and then having that conversation of like, is this actually a need? with the type of business that you're trying to build and run? Is this like uh, what you actually need to be doing? Um, or are you just doing it because that's what you read about on some blog somewhere that, you know, you needed to take out a line of credit? Um, like everything else, it, it's being really conscious with your thoughts. I like it, man. I like the middle ground approach. I always have people that come onto this podcast they are super wise because they're like, there's many paths up the mountain. Let's find which path is going to serve you and Bingo. go up that path. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> so Bingo. Good. Nobody ever comes onto this show and they're like, this is the only path. Yeah. This is the only path. You have to do it this way. You have it's to do just it garbage. This way. I mean, there's seven, what is it? Seven and a half billion people on this planet now. I mean, yeah. to act like, like there's only one path for everybody to, 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 to build a business or to do something like that. It's, that makes no sense. So what would be your advice for somebody who wants to get started in taking control and, and guiding the flow of their cash to start funding their ideal lifestyle, their experience? Where, where do they start? Yeah, I, the, the first step is literally figuring out what I always say is where you're currently located, right? And so like AJ, if I was like, hey man, um, let's go on a road trip together. And uh, let's, let's go to San Diego. Do you want to go to San Diego? Let's go to San Diego. Um, and you'd be like, great. Yeah, we should do that. But then I pulled out my Google Maps. And for some reason, I was doing something weird where I didn't tell Google Maps where I was currently located. And I just said, take me to San Diego. But, but you don't know where I'm currently at. There's zero chance of me ever ending up in San Diego if I don't know where I'm currently located. And that's how most people start with their money is they have a vague idea of where they want to go. Like, I kind of would like to do this or have this future or travel here or do that. They have a vague notion, but they don't even know where they're currently at. And so there's no chance of them being able to bridge that gap to get where they're going. And so what do I mean by that? It just means getting some sort of tool. It could be Excel. It could be a pen and paper. It could be YNAB. It could be every dollar. It could be mint.com. I don't care, but you got to get some sort of tool that gives you a realistic understanding of, how much money are you bringing in? How much money are you bringing is, is going out? Are you saving any at the end of that? Are, are, you, are you negative at the end of that? What's happening? And if you're running a business, this is your typical, you know, P&L statement, but you just have to start by like getting really clear on what's going on. And maybe you, if you're a business owner and you've got a, an accountant or somebody who's helping you with this, maybe it's time to just go pull that information out. When's the last time you've really looked at it and seen where you're currently located? That, that's always the first step that you have to start with. So once somebody aligns with the truth, then what do they do? So from there, you... Yeah, sorry. Uh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Um, so from there, going back to our road trip example, once you know where you're currently located, now we have to get super clear on where it is you want to go right? We have to know what that vision is for the next three to five years. And uh, one of my favorite books on this topic is um, called The Vision Driven Leader by Michael Hyatt. And he talks a lot about creating a clear vision, especially for your business, but also for your life and how that fuels it. Um, 
And so for me, what I do is I have a vision document that has like bullet points of where I want to be in the next one, three, five, and 10 years. Now, these aren't goals. These are just bullet points of where I want to be in my life. City I might want to live in, what I want my day to look like, um, what I want the business to be like, <clears throat> what products I want the business to have, what, you know, what, sort of, what sort of state of being do I want to be in? And I'm really clear on that. Now we have, okay, here's where we're at. And here's where we want to go, right? Now we know those, those two endpoints. And so now we can start doing the stuff in the middle, which is what most people think of as actually budgeting, right? This is where we, okay, how are we spending our money right now? And then knowing where I want to go, do I need to make more money? Do I need to cut some expenses? How can we fine tune this? What steps do we need to take in the middle to actually make that sort of journey happen? Awesome. So I wanted to address one thing here. I want to go back to aligning with the truth sure. uh, because I think it's a big, big thing that most people don't do because they're terrified to, to align with it. Like for instance, we have somebody within project chef right now. He hasn't checked his bank account in three years because he's terrified to look at it. He's a very successful man, very successful business owner. He got kicked in the face in the game of business three years ago, completely derailed him. And he's been in just a loop for three years. They're surviving, they're doing fine. But for him to like get back on feeling like he's on purpose and creating his desires that he's on earth to create, he's just like hiding from the truth. So what advice do you have for people who are afraid to look at their financial situation? How do they face it? That's a good one. That's, um, that's a tough one. And that's, uh, I, think, I think the thing that immediately came to my mind, um, are, you, are you familiar with um, Jordan Peterson? Mm-hmm. Have you seen his stuff? Um, yeah. One of the things he, he talks about a lot that he's used to help people deal, deal with their fear um, is like very small incremental shifts. And so he, he gave a story one time about somebody he worked with that was deathly afraid of, of getting on an elevator. Um, and so he, the, the way that he worked with this person to get over it was he started by um, just bringing them into a building that had an elevator in the building. So we're not going to get on the elevator. We're not even going to look at it. Just you and I are here together in this room and there's an elevator in this building. Okay. And he did that a few times until that person felt comfortable enough to go, okay, it's not a big deal. Elevator in the building, whatever. And then Jordan Pearson was like, so then what we did is then we moved to the same uh, hallway as the elevator. And so, okay, um, you're, we're still not on the elevator, but we're just in the hallway. The elevator's down there. You might can see it if you look around the corner, but like, no big deal. Did that a few times till he got comfortable. He sort of speed this up, right? And so then, then he gets to where he's doing it a few times where they're standing right outside the elevator, but not getting on it. Eventually where they're getting on the elevator, but they're not moving. They're just standing in the elevator. And then eventually they get to where they go one floor and then they get off. And they do that a bunch. And eventually over the course of however many weeks and months it takes, the guy was able to get over his fear of using the elevator. Nice. So they boiled the frog. Bingo, right? Bingo. So, so I, I would probably take the same exact approach with the financial situation, right? Like we, we don't start, if you're scared, we don't start with like all of the numbers for everything, right? <laughs> like let's go pull the P&Ls for every single year you've ever worked in business and like get your current net worth and everything out there. Let's not do any of that. No, let's just start with like, okay, how were sales last week? Like, and we don't have to look at expenses last week. Just look at sales last week right? Well, what was that like? Oh, we did that much in sales. Great. You know, cool. What about the week before that? And just sort of incrementally start introducing, okay, well, how about, how about some basic expenses? What are we paying for our software right now? Right. And so uh, assu this guy in particular, I'm assuming if he's still in business, he's got to have somebody who is doing the books for him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. His who, wife's who doing the books. In, right. And so if I was, if I was the wife, then I would just start incrementally bringing in very small things and work together. Each week, we're going to add something new right? This week, we're going to look at just the sales. Next week, we'll look at the sales and the software expenses, right? And we'll start sort of incrementally doing it because I don't think dropping a bomb is, is the way to do something like that. Um, awesome. Be awesome. patient with yourself, you know, be patient. And it may be as simple as just installing the Chase app on your phone. <laughs> that may yes. be where somebody Yes, starts. that would be a perfect one. Yes, absolutely. You don't even have to log in, just get it on the phone. So good, man. So good. I love it. And um, 
My next question for you, I had it and it's, and it's gone. Man, I've never been stumped like this before. You got so enthralled with the elevator story. I did. It's a very different approach than I would take. One of my other favorite stories for that is, is Tony Robbins helping somebody mm-hmm. quit smoking. You may okay. have heard that story. No. Okay. So in order to get the guy to quit smoking, Tony just went and bought a lot of cigarettes, packs and packs, <laughs> and said, you'd like to smoke? He goes, yeah, here's, here's a cigarette, smoke it. And after he got done, here's another one, here's another one. They put two in his hand, smoke both of them at the same time, like until his mouth is just full of cigarettes. And he's like, keep smoking, keep smoking. And eventually the guy's like, you can't make me smoke. He goes, I know. And that was it. The guy was done smoking that day. But That's he solved crazy. it from the other extreme side the of indulgence. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like taking to all the, on the other side. That's typically my path when I'm working with breakthrough work is the extreme cool. indulgent side. Yeah, yeah. Because cool. it creates enough pain for a person to then choose not the pain anymore. Yeah, yeah. And there's different yeah. ways to create that pain. Um, on on uh, the personal finance game, uh, you're big on profit first. Mm-hmm. Do you believe that's a really good way for business owners to start directing their flow of money or is it a different different thing? Yeah. So I, I, I'm a huge fan of profit first and um, like, like what we've been talking about, it's important to recognize that every business is different. And so um, I'm a massive fan of the philosophy of profit first, which basically if you're not familiar boils down to instead of revenue minus expenses equals profit, you do revenue minus profit. You take that profit right off the top and then whatever's left, that's what you have to run the business by. And so you force yourself to basically run a more efficient business on what's left over and you guarantee that you're going to make your profit out of the gate. Um, and it works off of human emotions and, and sort of cognitive biases that we have. It, and it works really well. The key is choosing your right numbers. And so it's recognizing that um, – if you're like, my dad's a great example. My dad builds houses for a living. He's a contractor. They have ridiculous amounts of materials, lots of moving parts and pieces. And that industry as a whole just has much tighter, thinner profit margins than let's say the online course business, right? Which is is typically gonna be more profitable because you're creating a lot of the legwork up front and then you're just delivering the product and focusing on marketing after that. And so the key is, is um, to start, I, I'm a big believer with profit first of still starting incrementally and, awesome. and not trying to say, I'm going to take 20% off the top. It's like, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. you can't just do that right now. If you've been taking nothing to 20, that's not going to work. You're going to break things. And is it taking the profit off of the gross revenue? So revenue comes in, let's say it's $2,500. You take the percentage off the 2,500 or do you do 2,500 then minus the expense and then take the profit from what's left? Um, so the, the key is to, to differentiate the types of expenses. And so you've got cost of goods expenses, uh, and then you've got operating expenses. And so you take the percentage of profit after cost of goods, but before operating expenses. Awesome. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I think a lot of people get that mixed up. So I want to get that clarified. Yeah, yeah. And if you could go back in time and give your younger self some wisdom to help them collapse time and get results faster, what would you tell them? I would tell him to pay himself sooner, (laughs) Um, which is counterintuitive because I think a lot of the times we hear like, don't pay yourself, reinvest all back into the business, grow, 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 which is helpful. But the problem with that is that if, if you do that and you get used to doing that, when it comes time to pay yourself, it's really difficult to do. And so it took me two years of running my business before I really started actually taking anything for myself because I was still working a day job and I could, you know, that paid the bills. Um, and so then when I switched over and needed to start taking money, it was a really like abrupt transition. Um, and so I would have started doing some more incremental of like paying myself a small salary sooner to get more used to that. And also again, build some of that scarcity into the operating of my business and forcing me to get more creative of how I'm going to grow it. Awesome, man. Well, where can people go learn more about you if they want some help with their business finance, personal finance, um, tools, resources, which I would highly recommend every single person listening to this to actually reach out, uh, call Nick, work with him in some form or capacity because it's um, it's really good and uh, you're an amazing dude. So where can they learn more about you? 
I appreciate it. Well, um, if you want to go check out my videos, you can go to YouTube and just type in my name, Nick True, or type in Mapped Out Money. That's the name of the website. Um, I actually just did a, a, a new updated video on Profit First last week. So there'll be a nice new one there for you guys. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, if you're interested in working with me or you just want to chat and, and see if there's anything I can do to help, I'm happy to answer questions. Just email me, nick at mappedoutmoney.com um, and I'll, uh, I'll get right back with you. Awesome. And what is like pretty much the number one way that you enjoy helping people with their money? Yeah. So um, there's, there's kind of two main ways. One is um, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people and um, it's sort of a, a structured situation where we'll hop on a call and we share screens and I dive into your finances and we help you create that game plan. Um, that's going to help you get from here to there and, and using money to do so. Uh, and then for on the personal finance side, so less on the business side, on the personal finance side, I also run group classes um, once a quarter called the money mastery class. And um, the next one will be in January. Awesome. Cool, Nick. Thanks so much for being here, brother. Sharing your wisdom. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Well, there you have it, my friend, Nick True. What a great dude. And I'll tell you, he was a huge help in uh, helping me set up my YNAB specifically for my business and starting to implement the Profit First accounting style. I now have a full-on system for proactively managing my money inside my business. You know, this business game, it's a wild ride. Like, there's a lot to learn. And I think many entrepreneurs believe that they can just kind of out-earn their way to financial freedom. Now, I'm not here to say that's a bad approach. But what I can say is I found when you are proactively, like, directing your cash flow, it always seems to increase. Now, I believe there's a reason why money is called currency. And if you dive down the rabbit hole on money, you'll find money is really nothing more than energy. And sure, people have lots of beliefs and stories around it, yet at the end of the day, I'd have you consider money is nothing more than energy. And regardless of what the economy is doing, money is constantly circulating. And if you buy into this way of thinking, then the game is simply about tapping into that ever-flowing currency and proactively directing its flow to fuel the lifestyle you'll desire. You know, I see so many people, they run a bullshit success equation with money and living out their ideal lifestyle. They say, when I have X money, then I will be able to live Y lifestyle. Yet when someone operates with that way of thinking, that way of being, they just never seem to arrive. Yet if they will choose to drop the success equation and lean into a new level of responsibility, then they're able to sit down and get clear on their ideal lifestyle align with the truth of where they're financially at, and then go to work directing their current flow to start creating their desires. Now, does creating their ideal lifestyle happen immediately? No, not normally, but it will happen a lot quicker than you'll probably think it will. So I hope this episode served you. If it did, simply take a screenshot of you listening to this episode on your device, post it over to your Instagram stories, and tag me at AJ Amix. And also, let's tag Nick as well, at Nick D. True over on Instagram as well. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Anthony Johnny Mix podcast. Until next time, my friend, I'm out. Peace. Well, that's all I've got for this episode of the Anthony John Mix podcast, but we have plenty more to help you become unstoppable in life and business. So head on over to ajamix.com for exclusive resources, information, and tools to help you break through to a new level of freedom, purpose, and success. I look forward to having you back for the next episode. Bye for now.